Understanding is like a sun Which gives light to all thoughts Which gives light to all the thoughts Memory is like the moon, it hath its new, its full, and its wane, its wane. Memory, understand. Shout, 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 up with your song, cry with the wind, for the dawn is breaking, march, march, swing you along, white blows a banner and hope is waking, song with its story, dreams with their glory, lo they call, and glad is the word, loud and louder it swells, thunder of freedom, the voice of the Lord, shout, shout, shout. From the light of heaven Strong, strong Stand we at last Fearless in faith And with sight new given Strength is a beauty Life with its duty Hear the voice Oh hear and obey These, these Beckon us on Open your eyes To the blaze of the day Shine To strive and sorrow Scorned, spurned Not have ye cared Raising your eyes To a wider morrow Ways that are weary Days that are dreary Toil and pain By faith ye have borne Hail, hail Victors we stand, wearing the wreath that the brave have won. Shout, shout, up with your song. Shout, shout, shout. Hello, I'm Ian Knowles, the Artistic Director at Chelmsford City Theatres. Welcome to the digital version of Chelmsford Civic Theatre. This is number eight of our online Zoom performances as part of Essex 2020 in partnership with the amazing Electric Voice Theatre and Essex Music Education Hub for tonight's performance, Soundings 8, 
Women of Essex Forgetting to Remember. Welcome back to everyone from last week and hello to anyone new joining us tonight. As usual for tonight's performance, please look at the chat notes on how to pin the live BSL sign language interpreter video to your screen for people wishing to follow the signing of this event and also look at the chat notes for any other technical issues. There will be a question and answer session after the performance tonight. So if you have any questions for any of our artists and experts, please send them to everyone in the chat box. We are delighted to be joined by our choir tonight. So when the choir are on, please switch to gallery view. As in the live theatre, please put mobile phones on silent and please turn your PC microphone and camera off. At this point in the evening, I normally provide you with cast details and information about our special guests. Well, tonight, in addition to our guests, we are very honoured to be joined by someone very special and another amazing woman from Essex, no less than the Madam Mayor of Chelmsford. So I feel that's enough from me tonight, and I'm now delighted to hand over to our Madam Mayor. Thank you very much Ian and good evening everyone. Echoes from Essex is our summer arts project delivered by Electric Voice Theatre in collaboration with Chelmsford Civic Theatre's Essex Music Education Hub and it's part of Essex 2020 and has many local partners creatively and scientifically involved including BAE Systems, Battelle UK, and Teledyne E2V. This is Soundings 8, Women of Essex, Forgetting to Remember. The last in a series which has been running every Monday night since the end of July on Zoom. We have been exploring the stories of women in science past and present in Essex through music by Essex composers, lecturers, talks and artwork. This last event reflects on all the women we've been able to talk about or with and many more who don't have time to delve into but hope you will be curious enough to find out about for yourselves. We celebrate this project tonight with the debut of our Essex Virtual Choir, some of whose members will perform work called Forgetting to Remember. A memorial chant declaiming all the women's names of our audience who have asked to be included. Our speakers tonight include Dr. Patricia Farrer, science historian, Emeritus Fellow of Clare College, Cambridge, who will provide a, a main history, a main historic summary. Sorry, I haven't got the right teeth in tonight. Luella Hull, a young engineering prodigy from Essex Steam Steamettes, will be talking about her own aspirations and what Essex Steamex meant to her and other young girls, mainly from the age of 11 and 18, and how to join it. Dr. Isabel Rio, quantum physicist from Teledyne E2V, will say a little about herself and will discuss the new music we are creating together based on her work on cold pressed atoms. It's called The Superposition of State and will be premiered at our grand finale performance on September 20th. We are also to be joined by representatives of Snapping the Stiletto, whose work inspired some of this project. And so please enjoy tonight's performance in the virtual Civic Theatre here in Chelmsford. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, in a moment, we're going to hear Dr. Patricia's reflections on the women that we've been investigating in soundings. But first, I'm very proud and excited um, to introduce the debut of the Essex Virtual Choir. And they're going to start by singing a chorus from our Echoes from Essex song, which has been written during rehearsals. And if you want to hear the rest of it, you will need to come to the grand finale on Sunday evening. And uh, you can join in, of course, as well. So choir, if you're all ready, so Sarah, Annika, Martin and James need to join us still. And uh, I think that's us. Okay, here we go. Echoes from Essex. Echoes from Essex. Across 
During this Soundings from Essex series, I've met some absolutely wonderful women uh, who are now scientists and composers. I've also discovered that Essex is rich in female pioneers from the past. I'm a historian and I study the past to see how we've arrived at the present. And the whole, for me, the whole point of doing that is to improve the future. During, over the summer, I focused on just six of Essex's women scientists, ranging from the 1660s right up to the present. One thing they all had in common was feeling alone. They were regarded as strange intruders into a man's world. But that's, but that has all changed. There are now over a million women working in the STEM subjects. And one of the most important organizations encouraging women into science is WISE, Women in Science and Engineering. And the woman who founded WISE came from Essex. Beryl Platt was born in South End, and she spent most of her adult life in Rittle. During the Second World War, she designed aeroplanes, and she loved engineering. She was determined to make sure that younger women wouldn't face the same obstacles that she had. She badgered people into giving her millions of pounds to send these buses around the country. And in the middle, you can see her standing in front of one of these buses. She's the woman in the middle of the photo. These buses were packed with scientific equipment and they enabled schoolgirls to acquire the technical skills they needed. And on the right, you can see Princess Anne congratulating Beryl Platt and presenting her with a special award. She often found herself the only woman in a large group of men, and that had long been a familiar experience for clever women. So on the right, you can see one woman in a sea of men, and she's taking private lessons in science because women weren't allowed to go to university. Education was a major problem for any woman interested in science and being excluded made one Essex woman furious, Margaret Cavendish. She protested it was hardly her fault if she made mistakes. I am not versed in learning. Nobody, I hope, will blame me for it since it is sufficiently known that our sex is not bred up to it as being not suffered to be instructed in schools and universities. And to resolve that difficulty, she decided to marry a very rich man. That's not a strategy I'd necessarily recommend, but it worked for her. This is her wedding portrait, and you can see on the right that she'd grown up in Essex. She was the possession of her father, but after her marriage, her husband, the Duke of Newcastle, was responsible for looking after her, and he encouraged her to write, study, and discuss the latest scientific ideas. So on the left, you can see her at the dinner table, 
surrounded by their circle of intellectual friends. husband bought books and instruments for her as well as paying for her to publish several herself. She thought that scientific research should be useful. She wanted to learn how to increase our breed of animals and our stores of vegetables and to find out the minerals for our use. Even now many men find clever women a threat and one standard line of self-defense is to accuse a female scientist of being eccentric. And that was the tactic that the diarist Samuel Pepys resorted to. He denigrated Cavendish by focusing on her appearance. A good comely woman, but her dress so antic and her deportment so ordinary that I do not like her at all. And over 200 years later, Ellen Wilmot suffered the same fate. She was a professional horticulturist who was an international expert on roses, had many plants named after her, and created a world-famous garden in Essex that was visited by royalty. Today, accounts focus on her supposed eccentricity. Gossip circulated about what she carried in her handbag. Many people said that she walked round with a loaded revolver, which may or may not be true. But somehow the myth arose that she carried giant thistle seeds in her handbag and secretly scattered them in her friend's gardens, where they later sprouted mysteriously. These thistles are still called Miss Wilmot's goats, but there seems to be absolutely no foundation to the story. It's too easy to marginalise women scientists by making them appear weird, but there are very solid reasons for remembering Ellen Wilmot. She was a member of the Distinguished Royal Horticultural Society, and in 1897 she was one of only two women to win a special medal to celebrate Queen Victoria's Jubilee. She was also among the very earliest women to be admitted to the prestigious Linnaean Society. At their London meetings, she met another distinguished woman from Essex, Guglielma Lister. Oh, we'll go this day a raglin, a raglin, a raglin. We'll go this day a raglin on. There's fungi and lichen and slime moulds to find that we are all for collecting inclined. And birds to watch in the sycamore trees and sketches to make of the plants that we see. All around the walnut tree, the queen of slime mould forever I will be. The queen of slime mould forever I will be. 
So as you can see, Guglielma Lister was a superb botanical illustrator, but she was also a world expert on slime moulds. And that may sound a rather niche interest, but it was shared by Emperor Hirohito of Japan, and he gave her this beautiful pair of enamelled vases. Slime moulds can be beautiful, but they are still one of science's outstanding mysteries. They're neither plants nor animals, yet sometimes independent cells collaborate and act as if they formed some sort of collective brain. So if some food is placed at the centre of a maze, the mould swarms towards it as though it had worked out in advance the best route for getting there. Modern scientists are increasingly interested in this unusual form of intelligent behaviour and Guglielma Lister is well known among specialists as a founding figure. She carried out a lot of research in Lyme Regis where her family had a second home but she decided that she preferred living in Essex and she died in Sycamore House where she'd been born and she carried out extensive research into the local plants. And as you can see, Leytonstone High Road was very different from now. She returned to this quiet haven, Essex. And two centuries earlier, another scientific woman sought the tranquility of Essex after living many years in London. Bow was a rural background. Sorry, Bow was a rural backwater. And that's where Elizabeth Tollett made her home. Like many women of the past, very few biographical details about her have survived. But her poetry gives a fascinating view of her experiences and her frustrations. She resented the way that men remained in control by not allowing women to be educated. That, that haughty man, unrivaled and alone, may, may boast the word of science. Isaac Newton and she met him several times. Unusually her father taught her maths which was mainly a boys subject so she could understand Newton's physics. Communicating scientific ideas is very important and she used her poetry to teach women who were less well educated than herself. As in proportioned intervals they go, swift in approaches and at distance slow or in a less, or in a wider space, as his directive force directs their race. Tis he compels them in their orbs to keep, though such an influence turns their ample sweep. As well as maths, her father taught her Greek and Latin, and she thought that all girls should benefit from a good education. In one poem, she wrote angrily, is this a crime for female minds to share the early influence of instructive care? Women were banned from university until the second half of the 1800s, and even then they needed rich parents who could afford the fees. Only a hundred years ago, many women had only a basic education at school, and that was the problem faced by Florence Attridge a skilled radio engineer who won a British Empire medal for her contributions to secret communications during the Second World War. But when she left school, she had little choice but to work in a factory. My name is Florence Attridge and I work at Marconi's New Street winding shop making radio sets. I've been here since just after World War I and stayed all through World War II. The shifts were 12 hours long and the women were paid far less than the men for the same work. Her job was to wind copper wire onto large coils. 
In the early days, nobody had radios at home, but they were rapidly becoming crucial for large ships, such as the Titanic. During the Second World War, the factory was bombed, but she was one of the lucky ones who survived. By then, she was involved in making secret radios, such as this set on the left that was used by spies abroad. She worked at Marconi for decades, but after the war, she decided to get married, and that meant she had to leave the factory, because in those days, married women stayed at home instead of working. Florence Attridge was just one of many Essex women who helped to win the war. So Joan Hughes was one of the first eight women to join the Air Transport Auxiliary, or ATA. She was a trained pilot, and she flew aeroplanes to where they were needed around England. And at the same time, the engineer Beryl Platt was designing the new Hawker aircraft that was so crucial during the war. And the photo on the right just shows you how few women were involved in this work. She was very shy. It took a lot of courage to walk into the department every morning. And she said, You could see by the look in the men's eyes. My God, there's a war on and we've got a woman engineer too. I couldn't ever let anyone down. We were testing and producing fighters, which really made a difference to winning the war. was the sixth and last woman in our Soundings from Essex series. By founding WISE, she left a permanent legacy. In the future, more and more women will be working in STEM subjects, and they'll be joining a long list of Essex's wonderful female scientists from the past. And in this year of STEAM, Essex 2020, we remember women in science, technology, engineering, maths and medicine, and th th whose contributions have been important, of course. And we've been lucky enough to hear about many of these from members of the public and from Ionia Richards of Eve Wright Arts Foundation, who have a wonderful website um, where there are various projects, one of which is called Caribbean Takeaway, about the women um, who came in the Windrush. And uh, the main contributor for our list was Juliet Townsend from the Essex Women's Advisory Group, who have a wonderful website too, full of inspirational women from Essex of all kinds, great role models. And the Essex Virtual Choir are going to tell you a little bit more about some of them. Forgetting to remember the women of Essex. Forgetting to remember Born 1623, natural philosopher and physicist, born at St John's Abbey near Colchester. Philippa Walton, born 1674, grandfather manufacturer, 
Elizabeth Tollett, born 1694, mathematician and poet who lived in Stratford and West Ham. Sarah Lee, born 1791, naturalist and author. Eliza Flower, born 1803, composer and sister of poet Sarah Flower Adams. Sarah Flower Adams, born 1805, in Harlow, poet, author of the hymn Nearer My God to Thee, sister of composer Eliza Flower. Margaret Gatty, born 1809, in Burnham on Crouch, marine biologist and children's author. Florence Lees, born 1840, English pioneer of district nursing. Alice Deal, born 1844 in Averley, where she was recently honoured with a Thurrock Heritage Plaque, professional concert pianist and, no and novelist. Ellen North Sidgwick, born 1845, physicist and activist for the higher education of women, principal of Newman College, University of Cambridge, buried in Sterling, where her sister lived. Mrs. Petty Pipson, Born 1845, Langham, physician and women's rights activist, one of the first women doctors in the UK. Nina Layard, born 1853, Stratford, poet and pioneering archaeologist, fellow of the Linnean Society. Ellen Wilmot, born 1858, a world famous horticulturist based at Wally Place, Brentwood. Guglielma Lister, 1860, lived and died in Leytonstone, but botanist and mycologist, one of the first women elected to the Linnaean Society. Rose Squire, born 1861, died at Friarning, the first woman to first gain woman. a sanitary inspector certificate and to hold an administrative post in the Home Office. Uh, Frances Hart Castle, 18, born 1866, in Rittle, mathematician, honorary secretary of the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies. Kate Luart, born 1872, at Effley Vicarage, nurse, served in the Boer and First World Wars, awarded the Royal Red Cross Medal. Ruth Benson and Butts, born 1877, a pioneer in family medicine and social care. Dr. Hilda Ormsby, born 1877, geographer, the only woman among 13 co-founders of the Institute of British Geographers. She worked for naval intelligence during the World Wars. Dorothea Bate, born 1878, was a paleontologist who is internationally recognized for her expertise in fossil mammals. She was one of the first female scientists employed at the Natural History Museum. She died in Westcliff on Sea. Evelyn Cheeseman, OBE, born 1881, entomologist and explorer, best known for her extensive solo expeditions in the Southwest Pacific. She collected around 70,000 specimens of insects, plants and other animals for the Natural History Museum. Jose Collins, born 1887, was a world famous actor and singer on stage and in early films. She lived in Luton where she is honoured with a blue plaque. Hilda Ingold, born 1898, was an innovative chemist, overshadowed by her husband Lord Ingold's work on inorganic chemistry. Dame Juliet Rees Williams, born 1898, was a political activist who established national maternity services to combat mother and child mortality and helped draft the 1936 Midwives Act. Florence Attridge, born 1901 in Chelmsford, where she lived all her life, was a radio engineer building secret spy sets at Marconi's during World War II. Imogen Holst, CBE, born 1907, prolific composer and conductor. 
daughter of composer Gustav Holtz, developed her love of folk music in Thaxted and influenced the growth of the present festival there. Dame Elizabeth McConaughey, born 1907, lived in Wickham Bishops and Borham, where there's a blue pa plaque in her honour. She is one of England's finest composers. Ivy Benson, born 1913, leader of a female jazz band resident at the BBC and a forces favourite. Retired to Clacton-on-Sea, where there's a hospital ward named after her. Dr Jean Gwyneth Branda, born 1913, Epping. A pioneer in physical medicine, killed aged 30 whilst on duty at St Giles Hospital London as a result of enemy action. Jean Floud, born 1915 in Westcliff on Sea, an educational sociologist, principal of Newnham College, Cambridge. Margaret Ursula Jones, born 1916, an archaeologist who directed Britain's largest ever archaeological excavation at Mucking, Essex, patron of the Thurrock Local History Society. Muriel Alton, born 1918 at Oxney Green, Rittle, was killed by a V2 rocket at Hoffman's factory where she worked in Chelmsford, aged 26. Joan Hughes, MBE, born in 1918 in West Ham, was a World War II ferry pilot with the Air Transport Auxiliary and one of Britain's first female test pilots. Emily Harvey, born 1921, was killed by a V2 rocket at Hoffman's ball bearing factory when the factory was devastated, sorry, in Chelmsford, where she worked, aged 23. Vera Baker was born in Bradwell on Sea. She also worked at Hoffman's factory and was killed when it was devastated by a German V2 rocket. Winifred Andrews, born in Kelvedon, another of the women workers killed by the V2 rocket at Hoffman's. Beryl Platt, Baroness Platt of Brittle, born 1923 in Leon Sea, one of the first female aeronautical engineers who went on to chair the Equal Opportunities Commission. Beth Chateau, OBE, born 1923 in Good Easter, horticulturalist, creator of the Beth Chateau Gardens at Elmstead Market, 10 times gold medalist at Chelsea Flower Show. Jean McFarlane, Baroness, born 1926, nurse and midwife, first chair of nursing at an English university, created a life peer, fellow of the Royal College of Nursing. Dr. Dame Rosemary Rue, born 1928 in Hutton, disabled by polio, physician, president of the British Medical Association and awarded the Edward Jenner Medal of the Royal Society of Medicine. Jennifer Worth, born 1935 in Clacton-on-Sea, nurse, midwife, and the author whose autobiographical books form the basis of Call the Midwife. Professor Lorna Castleton, born 1938 in Rochford, fungal geneticist, distinguished for her analysis of the mushroom Coprinus cinereus and a fellow of the Royal Society. Tina Aparicia, born 1925 in Trinidad, where she was a teacher, trained as a nurse in England, worked as a midwife in the Thurrock district. Carol Sidney was born in 1943 in Westmoreland, Jamaica. She trained in Greys in the 60s as a midwife and nurse. Nell Green, born in 1938 in Jamaica, came to England in the 60s to train as a nurse. Lenore Sykes was born in Port of Spain, Trinidad. She was a trained nurse and licensed midwife when she came to England. Charlotte Finogène, born in St. Kitts, became a nurse in Colchester in the 1950s. Rosie Bobby, born in, in the West Indies, became a nurse in Colchester. Peter Pritchett, born in St. Kitts, became a midwife and the first senior nurse child protection officer for Redbridge. D. Ramlal, from the West Indies, worked as a nurse in Ilford. Resilient and determined, she kept training and moving on because racial discrimination stopped her from being promoted. 
to her, nurses are conquerors because they help to beat illness and suffering. Thank you, Essex Virtual Choir. I hope everyone will be inspired to find out more about these inspirational women and, uh, and about some more who were suggested by members of the public. One, Brenda Burnell, a software developer. Who was on the previous slide? I think you might have seen her at the bottom. She was a software developer who during the 70s worked in North East Thames Regional Computer Centre. Oh yes, there she is. She's at the bottom of that one. Um, and she has been working throughout Essex and she's now retired. Um, and at the very bottom there, you'll see Dr. Sarah Luke, who's a relation of one of our choir members. And she is a consultant paediatrician specialising in neurodisability and safeguarding. And she works with Barking, Havering and Redbridge Clinical Commissioning Groups Association and North East London Foundation NHS Trust. And they cover areas of uh, Essex. And of course, last but not least, on our next slide, we have the women in STEAM who we've actually worked with from Essex. And as you can see, it's a very, very long list. Um, so it is, it uh, starts with Amy Petz, who was an analytical chemist, and Ingrida Ureita, as you can see. Um, uh, oh, I think we have the old list here, so I might have to uh, just jump around uh, from one to the other. So I shall go through the list that I see here. Dr. Isabel Rue, I'm going to introduce you to later, and Ingrida Ureita and Sarah Clare, both mathematicians that we've worked with and Helen Jacobs and all her um, lovely colleagues who you'll see underneath her name there they were all helping us with our splash burble gurgle and whoosh which uh, we did with children in workshops and the, the results of that if you missed it last week don't miss it on the 20th we're going to be playing their mega song cycle that they've learned about saving water in Essex um, and then on the next slide, we have uh, all the rest of them. And I'm going to read them out from the slide because it's not the same as my script. So Dr. Mariam Imani, who's an engineer from Anglia Ruskin. Dr. Gotami Wirakun, who was talking to us about lichens and slime mould uh, because she's a great uh, devotee of um, uh, Guglielma Lister, who you heard about earlier. And then Dr. Hefsi Angela Tego, who's a skin biologist and who has a very interesting practice here in science communication too. And then we were lucky enough to find Caroline Rickson, who was a communications engineer in Marconi's in Chelmsford, but she's now a maths teacher. Um, so that was amazing. She was uh, in uh, Marconi's, working in the same building as Florence Attridge, but she was there in the 70s, 80s, just after Attridge died. And then we had Vicky Platt, which was another amazing thing for us because she is the daughter of Beryl Platt, who you are hearing about, the engineer. And then, of course, we had two very special people, Sandra Lawrence and Ailsa Wildig, who were um, talking to us about Ellen Wilmot, the horticulturalist. And Ailsa is a volunteer at Worley Place, which is where... Ellen's Gardens are and they helped us do a podcast which you can still um, hear on the website. There'll be lots more podcasts coming up in the next few months too about some of the scientists we haven't managed to do yet. And then you'll see that there's some musicians so we get bottom billing in this list um, but for no other reason that, than that, I, that I want, we were going to talk about music. The first one is Cheryl Francis Hode helped with our workshops with the children too. 
And Cheryl also wrote the piece about Florence Attridge, which you can hear in full on the 20th. And Elspeth Manor is a young composer who's living and working in Chelmsford, and she's an artist, and she drew that beautiful painting that you saw of Worley Place and Ellen Wilmot's um, garden. And she also wrote a piece which will also be performed on the 20th um, about Ellen Wilmot's garden. And then we have Nicola Lefanu, who's a great composer from Essex, who helped me a lot to find music by her mother, Elizabeth McConkie, who one of the choir members mentioned in that list. And um, she allowed us to use a piece of, uh, a piece of her mother's, which is now no longer possible to buy, it's out of print. So that was wonderful. And we will have some works by her too on the 20th. And then we have our own Simone Ebbett Brown, who's our uh, sing one of our singers in Electric Voice Theatre. And she uh, is an Essex girl. She went to the same school as Elspeth Manders. Um, and then Nicola Collis, who's a musician from the Essex Music Hub. Um, and she helped with the workshops um, for the children as well. And Annabelle Moulton comes last, but not least, who was the viol player. You heard a little bit of her playing with the Margaret Cavendish pieces. So, um, and that leads me back to Isabel Rue, who was on the list earlier on. And she's our last scientific guest of today. She's our last scientific guest. So hi, Isabel. Um, hi. She's a physicist from Teledyne UTV in, in Chelmsford, and she's been helping me write some music for Sunday's performance. So I, I'm sure, Isabel, the, the audience want to know all about your physics first. Hello, and uh, thank you very much inviting me tonight. So I'm Isabelle Rieu and I work as a scientist at Teledyne UTV. So this company has been based in Chelmsford since the 40s and was previously known as English Electrical Valve Company or EEV or Marconi Applied Technologies. So we are specialized in high power radio frequency sources that can be used, for example, in radars or to generate X-rays for radiotherapies to treat some form of cancers. We also produce imaging sensors like CCD cameras that are qualified for space application. Our sensors have been integrated in over 150 space missions like the Hubble telescope or the Curiosity Mars rover. And I believe that our sensors have visited all the planets on the solar system. And it is also important for us to investigate new technologies so that we can still deliver state-of-the-art systems in 10 or even 20 years. My expertise is not in radio frequency sources or CCD cameras, but in quantum physics. We are currently developing sensors to measure the gravitational field that are based on something called atom interferometry. The idea is to trap and cool down atoms called to the absolute zero Kelvin using a resonant laser field. At this temperature, the atom form a cloud that is then dropped. We can measure their acceleration using a set of laser pulses. And as they are in free fall in an ultra high vacuum, their acceleration is actually equal to the acceleration due to gravity. And measuring the gravitational field gives indication about the repartition of the masses around the instrument. So for example, if the instrument sits above an underground void, the gravitational pull will be lower than normal. And on the contrary, if the instrument sits above a dense rock, the gravitational pull will be higher than normal. This has actually a lot of application, for example, in civil engineering to check that a field is safe to build housing or for the early detection of defects in the road networks. So, um, Isabel, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to know that your quantum physics helped somebody to build my house without it falling down. That was, that was something new that you hadn't told me before. <laughs> So that was a really nice thing to discover. So we, we've been working a bit on, well, Isabel has been trying to explain to me the quantum physics. Now, obviously, I am not a scientist and I can't understand the physics. I think, Isabel, you'll back me up there. <laughs> I wasn't really getting the actual detailed physics. But what I did, did discover, and because Isabel was able to show me in a really 
clever way and I think she's just done a wonderful description of it um, how how actually there's a lot of similarities with um, with music and it's very possible as it is with music to rather than thinking you have to understand all the detail to grasp the ideas and to grasp the feelings and the beauty of it because it is I mean quantum physics is a very beautiful thing isn't it Isabel? It is actually it's it's something um... I, th I know it's something that can sound scary because it's very mathematical, but actually um, the interaction of, uh, of light with matter is something that is beautiful and that uh, um, sometimes it's actually possible to see the atom being trapped and, uh, and forming this uh, cloud of atom. And, uh, yes, you tried to show me, didn't you? Yeah, I and tried. You see, but it was difficult. <laughs> I, I chose yeah. the wrong day. But that, would, that was an amazing idea that you could actually see yeah. it. You can actually see them. And uh, I, find, I find actually very beautiful the fact that you can trap and cool down something just with light. We don't use uh, cryogenic tools. We just have atoms in vacuum and light. And we manage to, to cool them down and manipulate them. And uh, just that, so the physics behind uh, the, the technology that is used for this, uh, these sensors, the physics itself is absolutely beautiful. Yes, and this idea that lasers and so light, so the waves from the light can actually trap something and, and you know, uh, do things to it. I mean, it's, it's a very musical idea that waves can move uh, towards something and change in some way. And then, you know, uh, it's, it, it, it's, it was a very easy thing to see how to make music from, which was great because I have to say I was a bit worried about quantum physics. I have worked with a, uh, someone before doing quantum physics, but this seemed much more difficult. But then I, I, I should know now that actually, if you've got the right person talking to you about it, and Isabel is the right person, then it, it really can be something that you can you can get the feeling and understanding from. And you, we decided, didn't we, that we were going to call, um, well, yes, I was going to say about the cooling down thing. We, we were talking about the cooling down. I was, I was enjoying um, watching Lauren while you were talking because I, actually I find it very interesting that she, she actually, as, a, as, a, as someone who can hear, I found it very useful to be able to hear you and see her at the same time. It sort of, it sort of helped to kind of feel um, what you were saying. But when you were talking about cooling down molasses, and that's one of the things I picked up in this idea that you cool things down like a sea of molasses. It's like you were talking about molasses. And we decided that we'd call the piece the superposition of state, which sounds rather strange. Do you want to tell people what that means? So um, if you consider a quantum object, you can actually have this object in different states. That would not be something you would have with a, a classical object. So for example, the object can be uh, at, uh, at rest and excited at the same time. It can be at two position in space at the same time. It's, it's quite counterintuitive when you consider this object as a particle. But actually, one of the big fundamental concepts of uh, quantum physics is that particle and waves are the same thing. So all the quantum objects are both a particle and a wave. And then if instead of considering the object as a particle, you consider it as a wave, you can see that you can split a wave. If you go to the seaside and you look at the waves and uh, you, you are at a pier, you will see the waves passing on both sides of the pier and on the same wave. And then maybe they will rejoin later. And it's this, uh, this superposition of state is that, is that you have a wave that can actually take several paths at the same time. And I think that's the interesting thing from the musical point of view as well, this idea that, that these patterns, these waves will join up in a slightly different way, but they are the same, but they create a different pattern. And this is a very musical idea that, you know, um, mm -hmm. that I've also been exploring with lots of voices. So there's lots of voices in this piece. Um, Unfortunately, we, uh, Isabel and I could talk for hours, but we can't because we've got lots of other interesting things to move on to. Um, so thanks ever so much, Isabel. And we'll come back to you um, a, a little bit later. And I, I, I'm, I'm going to really enjoy you hearing the piece when it's finished. It will be finished by Sunday. I'm looking forward to hear that. <laughs> 
Um, so, because this has been an endlessly fa fascinating uh, uh, project, really. And I've been, you know, our researching uh, for this project started in the Chelmsford Museum before lockdown, before Christmas. Um, and we found this exhibition called the Snapping the Stiletto there. Hi, my name is Amy Cotterell and I'm the founder of the Snapping the Stiletto project. So Snapping the Stiletto was an Essex County Council run project in partnership with Share Museums East and funded by the Esme Fairburn Collections Fund. And the project aimed to research the stories of local women that were held in local museum collections to celebrate the centenary of women getting the vote and the 50th anniversary of the Dagenham Ford workers strike. Uh, and also to celebrate strong Essex women and to make people rethink the Essex girl stereotype. And um, the, the project um, did this in several different ways. We had volunteers from around the county going into their local museums to do research and found out lots of different stories that we didn't really know about beforehand. So one of the, the really interesting stories is that of this lady, Adelaide Hannah Hawkin. And Adelaide was an incredible woman. She was a suffrage leader in South End. She went on to become a justice of the peace but she also set up during World War One this clinic for local mothers and their babies. And the site where they met is still a parent and baby centre today. And it's just an incredible story that there is that continuation of her work a hundred years later. It's incredible. Uh, we also, through the project, um, took part in Colchester Carnival. We had a festival um, celebrating International Women's Day uh, in partnership with the University of Essex at their Colchester campus. Um, and we had an exhibition which toured around the county sharing stories from museum collections. And we're really proud of everything the project accomplished. Uh, but we found actually there were quite a few gaps. So I applied last year for a Heritage Lottery Fund, or National Lottery Heritage Fund as it is now, grant, um, which was successful. And Essex County Council have just recruited a new project manager who will be taking that forward as I've moved on to a, a new role in London. Um, the motivations for the second project are to fill the gaps. In museums so as I said typically museum curators have been white middle-class men telling the stories that interested them which have been those of white middle-class men if you go into a, an older more traditional museum women's stories tended to be limited to the domestic gallery there's the mangle the first hoover um, but nothing very much about women in the workplace women as activists and the rest of women's lives outside of their house and we really wanted to to make sure that that didn't stay the same we found that although um museums perhaps had some things about working class women particularly women in factories like this lady they they have general photographs and and the equipment they worked on but no information about the individuals and their lives so we want to collect those stories um, there's very little on migrant women um, apart from those who came over to the UK particularly from the Caribbean to train as nurses after World War II but very little else on women who've come from other parts of the world and and other ethnicities it, it's very very white focused in museum collections and even before everything that's happened in the in the last few months museums knew that this wasn't right and they needed to be making a change and actively collecting stories that were more representative of the communities who they hold things in trust for 
um, we also really struggled in our project to find information about LGBTQIA women currently in, in museum collections. Um, and that's ridiculous. It's been such a century of change in gay rights. There must be some amazing stories, everyday stories of women falling in love. And we, we want to make sure that they aren't lost so that in another hundred years, when researchers come to look in collections, those stories are there and they know what it was like for these women. We found there's not very much about uh, women in, in STEM, which generally is, is the case in, in everything women in STEM. We need to, to make sure that those pioneers' lives are captured. Um, one of the, the things we were quite proud of with the first project was getting an article onto Wikipedia about Bertha Mason. Bertha was a businesswoman in Colchester who had one of the first, if not the first, photocopier companies in the country. Um, she didn't have an article on Wikipedia, but she was an important pioneer. And it takes a lot of work, it turns out, to get articles onto Wikipedia. Um, only about 18% of biographies on Wikipedia are about women. Um, yet yeah, we're 50% of the population. So it turns out there are a lot of intrinsic biases towards men in how Wikipedia articles are researched and checked. And actually they are checked before they go online. It's, it's a lot harder to get fake info onto Wikipedia than people think it is. Uh, so actually that, that was a huge thing that we wanted this second project to address. We also found in our first project where we couldn't actively collect stories that people were desperate to share them. People wanted us to know about their mothers, their grandmothers, their aunts, their sisters who, who've led these extraordinary lives. And we wanted to make sure that there was a way for those stories to be captured. And that's what this second project will aim to do. So please do follow Snap the Stiletto uh, on Facebook, on Twitter. I'm sure there'll be some wonderful information coming out from Essex County Council soon about their plans for the future. Thank you. Um, Snapping the Stiletto was um, an Essex County Council project. Some of you may already know about it. Here's my Snapping the Stiletto bag that I still use. <laughs> Um, and it was a project which was about looking at how women's lives have changed in the hundred years since women got the vote in 1918. Um, and particularly also a key aim of it, of it was ch challenging stereotypes of Essex women by celebrating strong Essex women. And they worked with 11 different museums in Essex um, and had a lot of volunteers who were researching stories, um, looking at photographs, looking at the archives, trying to um, find out some different information about women who'd been forgotten about or whose stories had never been told. I think one of the things that they, um, being a museum project, they were very keen to represent women's lives in museums because often the collections don't really show that. And they uncovered some fascinating stories about Adelaide Hawkin, um, who set up a mother and baby clinic in South End. Um, they looked a lot at the women who'd worked at Marconi, which I think is where Francis found, about, uh, found out about Florence Attridge. Um, various suffragettes, but also people were researching their own family members. And I think it was really lovely the way um, people just looked at their own families and the women around them and, and celebrated their stories as well. Um, there was um, some pop-up events related to Snapping the Stiletto. They have a website, so you can, you can have a look on, on, on that and have a look at some of the blog posts and look back at what they did do. And there was also a festival um, where they had lots of different speakers telling stories about some of the women they'd found out about through the research. And then one of the, um, I guess, one of the things that did come out from looking at these women and how women's lives have been underrepresented in museums, um, Amy Cottrell, who was hopefully going to join us tonight, but unfortunately can't, managed to um, successfully bid for some more money to do Snapping the Stiletto version two, which is literally about to happen in a couple of months time. Um, they're just appointing the people who are gonna take this project forward. And the focus um, now is gonna be working on with a smaller group of um, partners, but particularly looking at even more, even less represented stories. They're particularly looking at working class women, um, 
BAME women, um, uh, women from LGBTQ plus communities whose stories have just hardly ever been told at all. So it's very exciting. They've got this um, amount of money and they're going to be working with lots of different projects around Essex. So um, there'll be an opportunity for you to get involved with that project when it starts up again. That's that's great, Katie. I feel I feel that it's it's been great to be here in Essex in the kind of gap between them finishing the project and starting again. It feels absolutely right because it's very inspirational, and we we have been able to to uncover a lot of, of people as a result of that. Um, yeah, it's really inspiring, isn't it? And it's nice having that thread that you feel connects you, doesn't it? It connects you to the past, but also connects you to the women who are up and coming as well, well which is really talking exciting. Talking about women who are up and coming, we're not just absorbed in the history of women in Essex, as Patricia was talking, but the point of history, as Patricia said, is the future. And this is where we look now with the help of our young engineering pioneer, from the Essex Steamettes, Luena Howell. Welcome to Luena. Hi, I'm hoping you can all hear me. So I'm Luena Howell, I'm 18, and I've been involved in the tech community for about five years now. Um, I started my journey by winning a competition when I was in year nine, that involved creating an MP3 music player that ran on the International Space Station and was tested by astronaut Tim Peake. And here's a picture of me meeting him. Uh, since then, I've won several other competitions and attended many events, from speaking at the World Summit for Artificial Intelligence in Amsterdam, uh, to teaching a programming class at an event at Masterclass. Most recently, I won third prize in a competition with my project that combined artificial intelligence with Spotify music data to create a personalized playlist based on your current mood. I'm also thrilled to have recently been shortlisted for the Open UK Young Person of the Year Award. Um, I volunteered for the last few years at events called Raspberry Jams, which are big tech meetups where kids and adults come along and participate in workshops as well as show their projects and look at things other people have made. Raspberry Jams are types of STEAM festivals, uh, with STEAM standing for science, technology, engineering, arts, and maths. And at these events, we love to showcase all the different and innovative ways the arts can be combined with technology. Um, at STEAM festivals, there are talks given by members of the community and workshops which anyone can come along to and take part in. There are also girls only events to encourage more girls in technology. And this leads me on to a group which I'd like to mention called the Essex Steamettes. Uh, the name coming from STEAM, which I mentioned earlier, and ETS because it's an all girls group. So the Essex Steamettes are a group of girls uh, between 11 and 19 years old who love being creative with science and technology solving problems with tech and sharing their learning with other people. Uh, throughout lockdown, I've been helping to run weekly online Essex DMET meetings. Um, at the online meetups, we run workshops where girls can develop new skills. Older members can either give or organize presentations. Uh, we sometimes have outside speakers who talk about their own personal journeys in STEAM. And we provide mentorship and support for girls to enter competitions or create their own projects. Um, it's a very supportive community for girls to develop their passion and interest in STEAM. Um, a recent project we've been working on involves an interactive musical glove. The project combines technology and music and dance, and one of our members programmed her glove to go alongside her dancing, and another of our members uh, combined it with her guitar playing. We have a number of upcoming uh, events lined up for the rest of this year, including several online STEAM festivals, girls in tech meetups, and space science activities. If you would like to know more or get in contact, uh, you can find us at southendtech.co.uk or on Facebook or Twitter. And to finish, I would like to give a short demonstration of the interactive musical glove playing a short section of the Electric Voice Theatre's own Echoes from Essex song.
Thank you. Though, you know, that was absolutely fabulous. I love that song. I've been uh, involved in this series for the last eight weeks, and every week I hear echoes from Essex. And I, even when I'm not, not on the show, I find it going round and round my head because I find it a very sort of joyful, very invigorating sort of tune, and I, I really love it. When, when I hear it in my head, I get a bit of a spring in my step and sort of bound along. So thank you for talking to us. You haven't told us what, what's your own future. What are you going to be doing next year? So I will be a first year uh, student at the University of Cambridge studying wow. physical natural sciences. Oh, fantastic. Are you going to specialise in the biological or the physical sciences? Uh, so physical, so I'm looking at more the chemistry, physics side. Oh, that's fantastic, because I'm at Cambridge, so perhaps we can get together and have a chat. That would be really good. That'd be lovely. <laughs> and Isabel, can I ask you as well? So, hi. Um, can you just give me in one sentence some important advice for any girl who's at school or like Louina about to go to university any piece of advice about how to succeed as a woman in science so um, there is no such thing as a male job or a female job so if you like science and you want to become a scientist just go for it just go for it I think that's absolutely fabulous advice just go for it have you yourself ever experienced discrimination in science Absolutely not. I, I've been very lucky on that, but uh, during even during my master's studies, it was in engineering, so uh, there was a lot of boys, but uh, no, never. Everything went smoothly. So, Louina, how important do you think it is to have a, an effective role model, an older woman that you can, that can perhaps mentor you or that you can model yourself on? Mm, I think it's incredibly important. Um, when I was just starting out, I there weren't that many role models around and I, I sort of struggled a little seeing um, having that influence and seeing possible pathways in uh, technology, engineering, science um, and I felt a bit lost for a little bit which is why I, I tried to be as involved as possible in things like the Essex Steamet, making myself very visible uh, to younger girls uh, to sort of be a bit of a guide, I, I hope, I suppose, uh, to show here's what's possible, here's what you can do, and maybe inspire them a little and encourage them into all the different pathways that are open to them, because they're definitely open, the opportunities are there. We just need girls courageous enough and willing to take them. So in a way, you're echoing what was echoing? That was echoing. A, that was a Freudian <laughs> slip. Uh, you echo, start singing if you say is, that. Echoing Isabel's advice to if you want to do something, just go for it. And I think that's absolutely good. don't let anyone stand in your way with this. If you see something you want, head straight for it. I think um, we, I think we might have some questions from the audience. Uh, Victoria, have we got any questions for our panel? Hello. Yes, we do. Thank you for oh, that. Let's Thanks. go for those. Thanks for everyone for sending them in. Um, so I'm conscious of time, so I'll only get through a couple. Um, but. Uh, somebody would like to know for Isabel, has quantum physics taught you any life lessons? So, maybe not the quantum physics itself, but it's more the way um, I had to learn it. So, my master uh, degree is in engineering and aerospace and engineering, and I actually um, uh, got the first graph of uh, quantum physics uh, in my PhD. And some people were saying that it was uh, not possible from someone uh, with an engineering background to move towards a more fundamental physics PhD. And uh, I think that with uh, enough work and effort, you can achieve whatever you want. Absolutely. That's really good advice. Thank you for that. Um, and we've had a couple of questions from our youngest choir member for you both as well. Um, Sarah got in touch and she would like to know from Luena, how did you make the musical glove? Right. Um, so the musical glove, I'll hold it up here. It might set it off. Uh, here we go. <laughs> it's made out of a BBC micro bit, which is a, a small circuit board. Um, and a mini mu speaker. Um, so you can see it here. I sewed the glove myself. Um, there's plenty of kits available online. Um, if you'd like, I can send a link to them afterwards. Um, and there's lots of resources 
um, weekly activities to learn how to use it so you can start creating your own projects. Perfect, thank you so much. And Sarah would also like to know, if this is for Isabel, is it scary being a scientist? It is not, it is very exciting. And the science, I think that when you first uh, discover a new topic, a new subject, it can be, people can feel a bit intimidated and thinking, oh, it's too complicated for me. That may be the scary part, but actually every problem, every topic can be cut into small pieces and each piece on its own is something that you can handle. So it's never scary, always exciting. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and I do actually have one final question um, for Dr. Farah. And I act, this is from me, sorry, but um, I'd like to know who you found most interesting out of the six women who you love learning about the most from the sounding se sessions. Oh, uh, well, there, there were some of them I got absolutely, absolutely fascinated by. Um, Elizabeth Tollett, I knew about before, and that Basically, I, I am the expert on Elizabeth Tollett, so I was obviously fascinated by her. But the new woman that I, I'm absolutely, fabulously interested in is Guglielma Lister, because uh, uh, slime mould, is it sounds so, so gross, but it's such a topical uh, subject. There's all these books being written about how trees can communicate with each other through chemicals and through fungi, and I think it really puts human life into proportion when you know that there's these teensy little things that look to us just like bits of mold but actually they can work out problems they can get through a maze um, they, they there's a very uh, interesting experiment some people carried out in japan they put a bit of slime mold on where tokyo would be on a map and then they put little bits of oat for the slime mold to feed on uh, in different places around tokyo where all the big towns were and what they discovered was that the slime mold just went along the major train routes. They worked out what the most effective way of getting there would be. I mean, they are extraordinary organisms, and I would just love to know more about them. That's amazing. <laughs> Lovely. Well, thank you so much. That's me done. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Victoria. So um, perhaps, Katie, you could round up for us what, um, what people can look forward to for, from Essex 2020. Yeah, I can. Um, I should say that uh, I've been having the pleasure of coordinating Chelmsford's response to Essex 2020 this year. So um, this has been one of the really exciting projects I've been lucky to get involved in. And I think this project's been really important because it's helped us learn about some really interesting Essex women from history and recognise their significant work and contributions. But as well as shining a light on the past, it's also allowed us to celebrate women and work that's going on in Essex at the moment making connections and inspiring people for the future. And I think so much of what we've heard tonight has been really inspiring. And I think there's a, there's a fantastic message coming out from the women from history um, and also the, the young women that we've just heard speaking, which is about don't let things hold you back and, and go for it. I think that's a, a fantastic message to end this evening on. So ECHOES really ties in well to Essex 2020, um, the aim of which is to celebrate Essex as a place of innovation through lots of different events and activities in this year of science and creativity. And so this year we've already hosted a wide range of events which have enabled people to get hands on with science in the widest sense of the word. And coming up, we have plenty more. So there are the regular activities that Lowen has already told us about, the South End Tech and Essex CMETS coding workshops, there's lots of creative events at the moment for Heritage Open Days. We've got the Thurrock Festival and the T100. And in October, there's going to be a focus on skills and learning, and there's going to be several talks, as well as one-off events like Black Chapel's Connect event, which um, is going to involve DJs and rappers and poets, yoga teachers and physicists all coming together to explore how science, arts and spirituality overlap and interlink. So there's a nice connect there between music and science, which we've been having running all the way through this project. And for really young girls, we've got the online toddler STEAM project, which you can hear a blog about at the moment. And you can also take part in stargazing. So there really is something for everybody. We're continually adding events to the calendar, so please keep checking the Essex 2020 website. And there are a series of podcasts now and some more ones on their way, so please take a listen to those as well. And as has been a big theme tonight, um, I want to just flag up Sarah Perry's new book, Essex Girls. Um, this is going to launch on the 1st of October, and you can hear her in conversation with Ros Green from the Essex Book Festival 
in what promises to be a really lively and interesting evening. Um, that's going to be a Zoom event um, and you can sign up for that and get a copy of the book too. If you want to get involved in changing stereotypes of Essex women, Mark Massey is doing a photography project at the moment, which is celebrating women from Essex, and he's still looking for women to photograph, so feel free to put yourself forward for that. And of course, we have Snapping the Stiletto version 2 to look forward to. So there is plenty of ways to get involved, and we are still open to new ideas, so if you have an idea for an event or an activity you want to run, then please get in touch. Um, it's just been fantastic celebrating such a wide range of Essex women and we're really looking forward to seeing what comes next. So thanks a lot to Electric Voice Theatre for helping us continue this journey. Thank you, Katie. Let's thank you, Dr. Katie. Um, <laughs> quantum physics and string theory. When you think about it, they go so well with music, don't they? Um, but at risk of turning into a, a late night open university session, which only my Dalek would understand. Actually, I don't know if you can see the Dalek there. I've no idea because I can't see what you're seeing. But there's a Dalek that's sat next to me um, throughout all these sessions and there's no one in the theatre. Um, but enough of that, I want to say a massive mega song thanks to everyone for tonight's event. I want to ask everyone who took part in tonight's performance, if you can, to try and take a bow. So switch on your cameras. Um, you have to make a noise or say something or wave your musical glove if you have one. Uh, and as I do the end credits, so first of all, thanks to Lauren Lister, a BSL signer. From the amazing Electric Voice Theatre, Francis, and also Electric Voice Theatre, Herbie, sound designer and production manager. From Chelmsford Theatre's Victoria and Alex, and everyone who has supported this project at Chelmsford City Council. Thanks to Mark DF, Essex 2020, Arts Council England, and Essex County Council. Um, I also want to thank our resident science historian, Emeritus Fellow of Clare College, Cambridge, and now our very own new Super Queen of Slime Moulds, Dr. <laughs> Patricia <laughs> Faro. So I think, I think I've got to call you that, Queen, Queen of Slime Moulds. Dr. Mold. Slime Mould. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Uh, you should come out with a rap record, I feel, with a name of that, Dr. <laughs> slime Mould. Anyway, moving on, I want to thank our special guest stars this week, which were from Essex Steamettes, Luena Hull, and, <laughs> and from Teledyne E2V, Dr. Isabel Rue. Now, we're also joined by the amazing electric, uh, sorry, Essex Virtual Choir, who were very electric, actually, Sopranos Helen, May, Sarah and Onika, Mezzo Abigail, uh, Alto, Helen and Melanie, Tenor, James, and on bass, Martin. Thank you all very much. And just one more thing, someone I know very well, Cultural Partnerships Manager, Chelmsford City Council, the incredible Dr. Katie Deverell. And of course, thanks to someone very special joining us tonight, the very busy Madam Mayor of Chelmsford. Thank you very Thank you. much. It's really been my pleasure to be here this evening. I've thoroughly enjoyed it every moment of it. And listening to all these wonderful women of Essex has been very inspirational. And uh, I congratulate uh, our, our younger ladies here this evening for really going for, for what they, their dreams. And it's wonderful. And well done, everyone. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, just again, I want to round up by saying thank you to our audience for joining us over the last eight weeks. Eight weeks, I can't believe it. And we all look forward to seeing you again as part of the National Heritage Open Day for the grand finale of Echoes from Essex at 7pm on Sunday, the 20th of September. You can book now for the grand finale where you will hear the children's song again all of the new commissions and music from Essex composers. And it's the last chance to hear Electric Voice Theatre live and see the Essex Virtual Choir when they will be premiering the whole of the Echoes from Essex song, which I know Dr. Patricia Farrow is looking forward to. Absolutely. There will, there will be more podcasts and features online from the project over the next few months. But for now, we leave you with the chorus of the Echoes from Essex song and the Essex Virtual Choir, and we hope you will all join in. Thanks once again, and good night. Echoes from Essex, echoes from Essex. A
across the county we hear them calling from every corner of this fair land the women who built this world of us the women who built this world with science technology medicine engineering us we courage and Round